welcome to Hollywood. The Armed Forces Radio and Television Service brings you the Hollywood Radio Theater, starring Dick Powell in Island in the Sky. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The Warner Brothers picture, Island in the Sky, was based on the best-selling novel by Ernest K. Gann, a masterpiece of drama involving aeroplanes and the men who fly them. And we shall see in tonight's thrilling attempt to rescue a crew of men isolated in the Arctic wasteland. And as our star of this Batch Act production, we have one of those amazing triple threat men of Hollywood. Actor, director, producer, Dick Powell. Now, Act One of Island in the Sky, starring Dick Powell as Dooley. This is a story about professional pilots and their special guarded world. Their Island in the Sky. In the world aloft, the age old factors of life and death assume their proper values. That's why professional pilots are uncomplicated, simple men. Their thinking must be straightforward or they die violently. In World War II, many professional airline pilots were attached to the Army Air Transport Command. They were of the Army, but not in it. First of all, they were flyers. In the icy emptiness above the Himalayas, in the skies of the South Seas, North Africa, and the cloudy vastness over Greenland and Labrador, they flew the material of war. Men like Murray, Denuncia, Stankovsky, Lovett, and Dooley. Denuncia. Denuncia. Yeah, Captain. See if we can get us a cross bearing from Desolation Island. We try to, can't race it. How about Goose Bay? Nothing to it. All I got on these headphones is bacon frying. It's the northern lights. Think we're going to pick up some ice? No, I thank you. Murray. Yes, sir. Where do you figure we are? 200 miles off the Labrador coast, sir. You sure it's not 201 miles? I think one us right here on the chart. No, yeah, yeah, well, maybe. I got a hunch we're almost over the coast. Suppose you figure out what kind of ground speed we'd have to make to be over Hamilton River Peninsula in about 10 minutes. Oh, that'd be 200 miles per hour, sir. That's just not possible. Why, anything's possible up here, son? Something wrong, sir? No, not yet. The, uh, the air's getting pretty cold outside, isn't it? And below. <laughs> How do you know? The kid's learning to read instruments. Frank. Yes, Daddy. You better wipe off your wings. Oh, sure, sure. Let's enjoy the view, huh? Of what? Hey, it's getting rough. Did I see? Pick up any signals yet? No, sir. Maybe you'll have to try your set. Okay, right now. Hmm, pretty, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Sweetest music this side of heaven. Think we might chance letting down through these clouds? Not that I'm sure where we are, that's sure. Might go back to Greenland. No. You want to tangle that short at night? Not me, Daddy. Well, we couldn't make it anyway. If we can't get into Goose Bay, we'll keep right on to Presque Isle. Yeah. Take a lot of gas. Yeah, that it will. All we got. You don't worry about rough air. It's just uncomfortable. You don't worry about snow or even the static. You do worry about the winds up here. They're invisible and powerful. But most of all, you worry about ice. It can kill. Captain, I just worked Goose Bay. Now, why don't they turn on the range? They say it is on. No, we're sure not getting it. Goose Bay tried to take a bearing on us, but they say our signals are too weak. How about Greenland? Still no go. Maybe Montreal? Nothing. Murray, where do you think we are now? Just coming up on the St. Lawrence. Maybe. Stars on the radio, it's pretty hard to be sure. Ah, that's a good boy. If you talk like that, I can believe you. You must have missed Goose Bay altogether. Yes, sir. But well, by the amount of our drift, I think we're at least of our course. Well, then we'll set a new one. Frank, uh, fly, uh, oh, fly 270. Mm-hmm. 270, Daddy. Stankowski. Hey, where's Stankowski? He's still back in the cabin. Hey, somebody go back and wake up that dumb engineer. I heard that, love it. If it wasn't for this dumb engineer, a lot of you running those guys would be in... Zinkowski, how much fuel has there left in the cabin tanks? Well, maybe a couple of teaspoons. Why? Trouble? Well, what does that sound like to you? 
Big trouble. Ice. Yeah, ice on the props. They're slinging the stuff straight at us. Don't you? Yes, sir. Transmit blind. Keep sending. Ask for bearings from anyone you can wear as press guard as possible. Tell them we're icing up and losing altitude. We're turning northwest until we run out of gas. You got it? Got it. Then send it. Yes, sir. <laughs> The pilots call it the jumping-off place. Because this field in the far northeastern corner of Maine was the last American runway before Labrador and Greenland and Iceland and Europe. Dooley knew it well, and Presque Isle knew Dooley. Lieutenant Cord. Yeah, now later, Angeles. Oh, excuse me, sir, but maybe you ought to read what's coming in right now. Uh, uh, well, it better be important, Corporal. Position uncertain, icing up fast, proceeding northwest until gas runs out. All stations take bearings. Merry Christmas, Dooley. Any instructions, sir? Yes. Get Goose Bay. Quick. Come on, the babies. Stay up. She can't, Daddy. We're just one big cake of ice. Frank, run the engines to 2,535 inches. Uh, 35. Okay. We're alcohol in the props. Hey, Nancy, you getting anybody? And so, I'm This is Presque Isle, Maine, calling Goose Bay. Calling Goose Bay. You getting Julie's signals? If so, take bearings. This is Presque Isle, Maine. we're going to fill in one of those blanks. Yeah, but how? We're close to stalling, Daddy. Yep, yep, let's take her down. 2100. Get back to the cabin. Stretch out on the floor. Yes, sir. Full flap. Full flap. Uh oh. Oh, oh, oh. Hold it, Daddy. Just hold it up. Just another second. What's wrong? Get out of there. That snapshot of my girl. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm a time to kiss her picture. Yeah, you know a better time. Here it comes. Cut the switch. Cut it. from. Angelique, anything more on Julie? Oh, yes, sir. Just came in. Then why didn't you let me know? Well, I said it just came in, sir. I haven't had time. You haven't had time. You want to come over to the staff room and tell Colonel Fuller and the rest of them you haven't had time? They're in a real good mood right now at one in the morning. Well, I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but you said Oh, give me that report. The search party is easy enough to organize, gentlemen. Now, the problem is where to search. Can't send planes out indiscriminately in this weather. Colonel Fuller, sir, a radio report from Montreal. Oh, thank you, Lieutenant. Gentlemen, we have a bearing on Dooley. At 2,300 hours, Montreal fixed him as north of the St. Lawrence. How far north, sir? Well, that they couldn't give us. But at least it indicates that Dooley followed his plan, went off to the northwest. That narrows down the area somewhat. Uh-huh to about 10,000 square miles. If Dooley flew to the end of his gas supply, he's at least 200 miles into uncharted territory. Yeah. Well, assuming, Captain, that he came down in one piece, how long could he live up there? 
Any game to shoot? Who knows, sir? Certainly not the Eskimos. They wouldn't have any part of that region. Hmm. Lieutenant Cord, how many ships are available for search right now? Five, sir, counting the general ship. The general can walk. Turner, uh, what's the disposition of the civilian uh, airline pilots? Well, sir, McMullen's here at the base. Willie Moon's westbound out of Goose Bay. Stanage is probably over Greenland. We haven't gotten a clear signal from there in 24 hours. What about J.H. Handy and Stutz? Handy is east to Iceland, sir. Stutz is on his way west from there. All right. Cord, your job will be to make radio contact with all of them. Tell them what's up. Yes, sir. Turner, you'll see that all five ships are ready with Arctic kits. Get with Major Ditson. Work out the stuff we're dropping. Right away, sir. All right, gentlemen, that's all. See you at 0900 in the briefing room. Calling Boomerang. This is Prescott calling Boomerang. Calling Willie Moon. Calling C-47 Boomerang. Hey, Willie, that's us. Yeah. Boomerang, go ahead, Prescott. What's he doing? On arrival here, you will report to Colonel Fuller at operations. Me? Uh-uh, I'm going through to Boston. Sorry, change of flight plan. Says you, I promised my wife I'd be home for our kid's birthday. You tell Colonel Fuller I'm a civilian pilot. So is Julie, sir, and he's down. Repeat that. Julie is down. Colonel hopes you will join the search party. Hopes? Tell him he dang well better let me. Will do. Uh, hey, uh, how about Stutz and Handy and Stanish? You can't reach them. We'll relay word to Greenland. Then get to it, boy. Get to it. Call the tower, Breezy. If this isn't Greenland, we're lost. Why, Captain Stanish, I'm surprised, aren't you? You mean those palm trees oughtn't to be down there? <laughs> Ginger K to BWA Tower. Looks like we're about seven icebergs west of the field. Roger, Ginger K. Altimeter 2990. Wind west 12. Hard pack still on runway. Clear to land. Thanks. Hold on, give me Stanish. Oh, Captain. Stanish. Word from Prescott, sir. Dilly is down. What? Where? Well, they're not sure. Maybe Labrador. They're getting up a search party. Tower. Yes, sir. Uh, tell operations to refuel us on landing. We're going on through. This morning? Uh-uh. you got to get some sleep. While Dooley freezes to death? Sorry, we're going through. Does a crew a real sack artist. Well, have you figured out anything? Like where we are? Yeah. No. In the morning, they'll break out the octet and take a shot of the sun. Yeah, if it comes out. Yeah, if the sun comes out. Well, anyway, about 30 gallons left in the tanks. You can get some generator power for the radio transmitter. If we can start an engine in this cold. Yeah. Oh, and food, yeah. Let's worry about food a little bit. Got three tins of salmon, eight chocolate bars, some sea rations, two marmalade sandwiches left over from last night. Uh, one of them's got a bite out of it. Mm-hmm, your bite. It's not much, but it's all we got. Oh, it's enough to last five men, maybe, oh, six days. Mm-hmm. After that? I'm not worried, Frank. Okay. If you're not, I'm not. Well, that's that again, Daddy. Sometimes a man has to lie. Even you, Dooley. You have always tried to live by the exact truth. Exactness is so necessary in flying. But you're down. Five men down in the middle of a great big nowhere. 
Well, tonight it's all right. This will be the easiest time for them. But tomorrow, or the day after, they're going to know what real hunger is. So find food, that's number one. Then find out where this nowhere is, so you can help the others find you. Stanish, McMullen, Stutz, J.H. Handy, Willie Moon. They'll come, do they? They won't leave you floating alone on an ice, ice cake. They'll come if it takes all winter. Yeah, but you've only got six days. Well, you've got to be strong, Dooley. You've got to keep them hoping, keep them believing. They'll find their strength in you. But where will you find yours? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Act two of Island in the Sky in a moment. You know, with our servicemen stationed in so many countries around the world, they have a wonderful opportunity to observe the customs and traditions of other people. They're finding out that these customs aren't so strange after all. For instance, in many countries, marriage is by proxy. The groom and the bride are not allowed to meet until the wedding is over. Well, this is the custom in Malaya, the South Celebes, and Siam. This is also one of the reasons for the veiling of Mohammedan women and the Hindu rule of Purda. In other words, the brides are hiding from the groom. Well, that has its modern counterpart in marriage among Christians. We say it's bad luck if the groom sees the bride before the ceremony. Well, we don't really believe that, maybe, but at least we have them come to separate rooms at the church and join each other at the altar. And the veil of a Mohammedan woman is as sacred as our marriage rights are to us. This is true about customs and traditions of all countries. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing these customs, by, by learning about them and honoring them. This, after all, is one of our traditions, to let the other fellow have the same rights and privileges that we want for ourselves. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Island in the Sky, starring Dick Powell as Dooley. <laughs> plane is down. To the man who seldom flies, or perhaps never, it's simply a statement of an unpleasant fact. To men like Willie Moon and McMullen, Stanish and Stutz and J.H. Handy and Colonel Fuller, it means more. One of your own kind is down. And it's important, important beyond anything else, that he rise again. Gentlemen, our information is still very sketchy. We can rely on the bearing the Montreal gave us last night. Dooley was somewhere in the vicinity of Lake Manu and uh, right where my fort is touching the chart. Now, at that time, Dooley radioed that he was proceeding on a northwest course. Well, if I might suggest, sir, since Dooley is a civilian, he might have taken the liberty oh, to come Oh, rats. If Dooley said he was going to fly northwest, he flew northwest. Yes, but we don't know that, McMullen. We're theorizing. Yeah, that's the trouble with all this stuff. Let's have some action. Now, suppose you let the colonel finish, Moo. Now, uh, we have word from Greenland on Dooley's fuel load when he left there. According to those figures, and assuming that he kept to a northwest course, he had enough gas to carry him four or five hours beyond Lake Manuan or somewhere right around this region. Oh, brother. Ain't nobody ever explored that territory? No, not for map-making purposes. It isn't to make it more difficult, the weather's against us. So what do we do? Wait till summer and everything's nice and balmy for us? McMullen, we don't want to dissipate our efforts. You and Moon are on hand, but Stutz, J.H. Handy, and Stanish won't fly in here till dark. Tomorrow morning we'll be ready to go. Tomorrow? What if Dooley and his men are injured? That is a possibility, of course. There's another still. They may all be dead. Colonel, can we count on taking off in four hours? No. Be back here ready to go in two hours. <laughs> Any luck? Uh, no game? Not even a bird in the sky. Uh, any firewood? Plenty of trees in those hills, but the wood's frozen solid. Well, I guess that figures at 40 below zero. That's awful mean country, Daddy. Nothing but whiteness and glare and silence. Yeah. Yeah, you can almost hear it. Frank, I, I, uh, I want you to do something for me. Uh -huh. It's Murray. Kid's pretty scared, I think. Keeps going on about his wife and baby. Yeah, I heard him. Maybe you might talk to him. It might help. You two are kind of near the same age. Uh, 
Heck, we are. I did my first solo before Murray was old enough to even spell the word navigator. Well, anyway, I, I think he'd warm up to you quicker than he would to me. How about it? Sure. <laughs> You know, if this little fiasco had come along about a week later, I might be sweating it out the same as Murray. You? Huh? <laughs> you mean you, a, a, a wife? Uh, I don't know. I'm always yacked about this dame and that dame. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's a test about, about Margaret. I ain't talking. Well, you sure are now, bud. Uh, come on now, then. Let's, uh, let's go back to the ship. I want to start up one of the engines so Denunzia can work the radio. <laughs> It better start pretty quick. Keep it going. Skipper, there's just so much juice in our batteries, and that's it. Keep it going, I said. Oh, please, Captain, no more. Okay, okay, Philip. Now uh, we'll have to get along without a generator. Sedanja, how many times can you transmit with what power we got left? Well, from what I just heard, maybe three or four short messages. Maybe less. Oh, that means every word's got to count. <laughs> well, who's that? Sounds like Murray. Yeah, he's up in the Astrodome again. <laughs> Murray, come down here. <laughs> Murray! Yes, sir? What kind of reading did you get this time? It just... It just doesn't make sense, Captain. According to the octant, we, we should be having coffee in Bangor, Maine, or... Paris or Stalingrad. All on the same latitude. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's me. It's so cold I can't think. Yeah, that's what's wrong. It's the cold, you know. The octant's got pneumonia. Same as our watches. Oil in the gears gets sluggish. Just won't work right in these temperatures. The navigator should know where he is. I don't. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> it's funny. Every time I get a good sight on the sun, the sun starts changing into something else. Hey, it looks like a toy ball, like a baby's toy. But perhaps if I try, just want to walk. Mm, like a baby's toy. Yeah. You see what I meant? Denanja? Yes, sir. Switch on your dynamo. We're going to send? Right now. One message and repeat three times, no more. Yes, sir. Ready? Ready. Okay. Dooley. To all stations. Down on Frozen Lake. Position uncertain. Guess about 600 miles. Boomerang to Pelican. Do you read me, McMullen? Pick them up in my brain waves. Wait a minute. Here it comes again. No injuries. Urgently require food. Batteries low. Hope to make one more transmission. Let you take bearings. When you arrive over area, San Julie. Hey, McMullen. Did your guy read that message from Prescott? Just like we knew he'd be. That beat up old balloonist? Hey, Ralph, yeah, I'm going to acknowledge Prescott. You bet I do. Tell him we're proceeding to the area given. What about the storm front? Forget it. Somewhere over the mountains, Dooley's waiting for us. Uh, 
Look, you guys, will you pay attention? Oh. Yeah. I'll pay attention, will you? Go on, then, aren't you? Well, it's real simple, fellas. Since we got to save our batteries, we use this portable transmitter. The hand crank job. You wind away on it like it was a coffee cup. Daddy, I got an idea. Just a minute, Frank. This here aerial is supposed to be hoisted up in the air by a balloon. And we ain't got one, I bet. Oh, yes, we have. But it's a blame cold. The balloon wouldn't have enough buoyancy. So we'll have to string the aerial between two trees. There's plenty of trees all along the lake. Maybe we could cut them down and make a log cabin. <laughs> Great idea. Well, I'll tell you what we are going to do. We're going to cut on some of those trees and pour some of our gasoline on them. If we can once get a fire started, we can thaw out enough wood to keep the thing going. Hey, Captain, that'd be swell, because I was wondering how we could heat up this coffee grinder. The grease and the gears is frozen so you could hardly crank it. I wasn't thinking about the coffee grinder. If we're in for a blizzard, and it looks like it, that fire is going to keep us alive. How are you cooking, Daddy? That's my idea. What is? Find something to cook over your fire. I'll run right down to the corner grocery. Oh, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Right now, how about helping me drain some gasoline? Now, come on, boys. Let's move it, huh? Okay, okay, boys. That's enough wood to start with. Stankowski, Murray, that's enough. Benanzi. Yeah? You and Frank pile the wood over there on the lee side of that snow bluff. Hey, uh, uh, wait a minute. Where's Frank? I know. I haven't seen him. Stankowski, Murray, where's Frank? I thought he was with you, Captain. It was a half hour ago. He went hunting. Hunting? Oh, cut it out, Murray. He did. He took the rifle and the ammunition. He said he was going to get us something to eat or else. Oh, no. With this wind kicking up the snow, he's got visibility for about 20 feet. Frank! Frank! Come on, boys. Yell together. Let him hear us. Frank! Again! Fire that rifle. Oh, uh, uh, what happened to that rifle? It's lost, too. Dooley! Stankowski! Valencia! And Murray! Ah, it's use. Gotta keep walking in a straight line, that's all. I'm gonna go walk around those circles. Just keep in a straight line. Need no bushes and trees. Just follow these footprints right back to camp and I'll go sleep. Oh, sleep. That's the most important thing in the whole wide world. <laughs> well, you know, I can't even see the footprints now. I can't see nothing. I know what old Dooley would say about that. He said, he said, take it easy, son. Rest. And that's just what I'm gonna do, Dooley. I'm gonna sit down right here. Oh, oh that feels so nice, so soft. Mm. Mm. I'm just gonna lie here and think about Margaret. She's so nice and soft, too. Warm. Every time I looked at her, I... Oh, always felt so warm and good, like Fourth of July at Coney Island. <laughs> oh, Frank, I can't hear a thing. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Well, sure you can, Margaret. Just pay attention to what you're doing. Stop looking at me, will you? But I'd rather look at you, Frank. Do you mind, really? <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever see anything so funny? I just never did take a good photo. Oh, wait a minute. For 25 cents, it looks pretty good to me. Besides, it was your idea, wasn't it? Well, I... I wanted you to have a picture of me. I don't need a picture to remember what you look like. I'll always remember, Margaret. Well, Frank. I'll always remember. Hey, McMillan. Julie. 
I can't buck these winds any longer, Mac. Another 10 minutes, and I won't have enough gas to make it back to Prescott. Same here. Until he's down below, it sure as heck we never spot him. Okay. Let's make a 180. Ralph. Well, yeah, what? Tell Prescott we're coming in. Tell him that if Stanish and Handy and Seth got in from Greenland, uh, just sit tight. Nothing anybody can do till the storm blows itself out. These two sticks of firewood are the best I could do, Captain. They, uh, they don't look much like a cross. That it'll have to do, Denuncia. Set it up right here by his head. Captain? Yes, Murray. Frank showed me a snapshot of his girl. I hope you took it out of his pocket. Why? Well, so... so you could return it to her. Maybe Frank would rather have it here with him. That's uh, the way I figure. I, uh... Any, uh, any of you men want to say anything? No, I suppose there's no need to. We all know what kind of a man Frank was. He was a good pilot. That takes an awful lot of things. I, uh... Well, <clears throat> there's, uh... Something in the Bible, some psalm about the shepherd, but I don't know it. I... Oh, I think maybe we better say something that we all do know. I... Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us Give this day, day our daily bread. bread. Forgive, forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those, those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the glory. glory. Forever, ever, and ever, ever. Amen. Amen. In a moment, Act Three of Island in the Sky. The Navy Enlisted Men's Club in Tokyo is a pretty nice place where the men of the Navy can sit around and talk, read, or play cards on off-duty hours. It's a pretty nice place in another way, too. There's a box on the bar for the spare change of the sailors, and every penny that's dropped into it goes for the support of their private orphanage called the Home of Affection. Over 50 boys and girls of all ages are fed, clothed, and educated there. The orphanage has formed its own self-government, and the children are learning what it's like to live by democratic rules. With the help of the enlisted men of our Navy, they're meeting the world with a new hope, a new dignity, and pride. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Curtain rises on Act Three of Island in the Sky, starring Dick Powell as Dooley. How long is the day? 24 hours, 1440 minutes, 86,400 seconds. Well, it all depends. If you're lost in the great white emptiness of the subarctic, time is measured by the icy paralysis which penetrates ever deeper and deeper into the body. If you're in the sky, Time is an almost mystic complex of RPM, inches of mercury, gallons of gasoline, degrees of drift, barometric pressure. Things known to men like Willie Moon and McMullen and Stanish and Stutz and J.H. Handy. Boomerang to all ships. Altitude 137 coming out on top. Where are you? being grounded 48 hours. That depends on how Dooley made up. Yeah. Well, if you picking up anything yet, no. Well, you know what the area is. That don't stop you picking up Dooley's signal. Sure, it does if he's sending out the emergency outfit, that hand crank job. How far can you hear one of them things? Maybe 25 miles. Maybe 100 if everything's just right. Well, don't bust yourself wide open with optimism, bud. 
Okay, let's pretend Dooley's got enough juice in his regular set. Let's pretend he's trying to pick us up. So what do we say? Tell him to build a big bonfire with lots of smoke. Tell him we'll be looking for it. Will do. Smoke? But at 70 below zero, smoke may simply settle to the ground. A plane down on a frozen lake. But what lake? That one? Or that one? There are a thousand lakes. From the air, you can see a hundred miles. But the wing spread of a plane may be only a hundred feet. Like looking for a chip of wood in the middle of the ocean. Dooley. Fellas, it's them. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. You sure? Yeah, they're calling us right now. Listen. Bill, big fire. Keep it going. Yeah? Yeah, what else? They say... Take it easy. How close do you think they are? Signal's pretty weak. They aren't close. Well, tell them that. Send an answer. In a minute. I've got to warm up my fingers. Okay. Uh, Mary, send Kowski. Get outside and start filling up that bonfire. Pour some engine oil over it. Maybe we can make some real smoke. Yes, sir. Right away, Captain. Hey, Captain, our batteries are almost gone. If I hold my key down, the juice will be gone in a few minutes. I think it'd be better if we took bearings on them. Are you sure? No, no, I'm not. But at least the batteries will last longer if we tell them which direction they're flying. All right, all right. Are your fingers warm enough now? Well, they're as warm as they'll get. Good. Then shoot the works. Boomerang. Hey, guys, we got Dooley. Somebody. Yeah, stop yagging so we can hear him. Huh? Well, what's he say? He wants to take bearings on us. He says to fly 140 degrees. 140? That's behind well, us. that's what he wants. That'll give us another bearing. Okay, 140 it is. New bearing, 170 degrees. 170. They acknowledging? Loud and clear, just about knocking my ears off. Dooley. Yeah? We've had it. Oh, what, the batteries? Yeah, just one half of one jolt left in them. Okay, okay. Then tell them to listen on 500 kilocycles, the emergency set, that coffee grinder. I'll try. That big station in Montreal is spilling over. That thing at all. We must be sitting practically on top of Dooley and we can't hear him. This is Stutz. We're at the end of our gas. McMullen, likewise. Gage handy. It makes it about unanimous. About your status. I didn't want to break up the party, but... What do you say, Willie? Yeah. This is it. Back to Prescott. gears on this coffee grinder must be moving in solid cement. Here, here, I'll crank it for a while. I'll go, Captain. Yeah, me too. You'll all get your turn. You'll all get your turn. All right, now, you, you can put some more wood on that fire and keep praying. Captain, lay off a second. Huh? Listen. Hey, it's them. They're coming, boys. They're coming. Hey, there's one coming over there. Oh, yeah. Hey, guys, that's the stuff. Come to the They don't see us. Well, they got to. Willie, McMullen, Stancy. <laughs> They didn't even see the smoke. And they were coming right over it. They'll never come back. They'll never come back. I'm sorry to call you men here directly from your ship, but we've got to decide our next step tonight. And you can hit the sack. Willie. Yes, sir. I believe your ship made the first contact with Dooley. Now, what time was that? What was your position? They're around 1,500. We were an hour north of the mountains. Proceeding on what compass course? Yeah, that's anybody's guess. Compass just won't stand still up in that country. Well, we had the same trouble, sir. The magnetic pole kept moving on us. 
Captain Standish is a long-distance call for you. It can wait, Lieutenant. The operator said it was urgent, sir. New York. Uh, all right, Standish. Make it short. Thank you, sir. Now, man, what I'm trying to get at is this. Five ships covered a certain area today. We've got to know what that area is so we can eliminate it on our next sweep. Colonel. Yes, Andy? I hate to say this, but for the first time since I started flying, which was a long time ago, I, uh, I just don't know where I've been. That's my case, too. Well, this is pretty extraordinary. Well, has anybody got any ideas? Yeah. All right, Stutz. Well, let's go back at night, fly the stars, plot one fix after another so we know where we are. Plan to arrive over the search area just before dawn. Dooley hears our engines, he'll shoot up a flare, and we'll see it. We will, huh? We told Dooley to build a big fire, but we sure didn't see any smoke. Well, maybe we were flying too high. Let's stay closer to the deck next time. Captain Turner, how about the weather? Well, there's a new low-pressure system forming over Hudson Bay, so it'll hit Dooley in about 36 hours and may last as much as four days. Oh, all, right. all right, all right. Here's what we do. I like Stutt's idea of going up on the stars. Tomorrow night we try it. Stake out what you men think is a new search area and hope that Dooley hears you and sends up a flare. If you're missing this time, well, you heard about the weather. Dooley's already out of food. He can't stand another blizzard. Oh, Stanish. While you were on the phone, we worked out a plan. The boys will tell you. Uh, who was it, Stanish? One of your dolls? <laughs> it was Murray's wife. Murray? Dooley's navigator? Yes, sir. She, uh, she wants us to give her husband a message. Don't she know we ain't found him? Oh, she says she knows he's alive. She says to tell him the baby's over his cold and, uh, that she loves him. Dooley? Dooley? You asleep? No, no. I've been trying to, but I keep thinking. What if the planes don't come back? They will, Murray. You sure? Mm. Try thinking about something else. But why should they come back to this same place? They looked here and didn't see anything. Tomorrow they'll try someplace different. Wouldn't you, Dooley, if you were flying one of those planes? Oh, they'll be back. All we got to do is build up a bigger fire tomorrow. You're not just saying that, Dooley. You're sure? I'm sure. I'll get some sleep. <sighs> I hope my wife and kid are all right. Hope can be murdered, but seldom the deep human strength of survival. Yet this strength is as tricky as it is powerful. It can become miserable panic if the leader falters. He said they'd come today, and they didn't. Yeah, and the wind's getting louder. What's that mean? If it keeps up all night, we'll maybe have another blizzard. Why don't Dooley talk to us? He just keeps walking around. Why don't he stay here with us? Because he went for some more firewood. Dooley! Dooley, come here! What's wrong? We want you to talk to us. Tell us something. Say something. Uh-huh. Anuncia? Yes, sir. Tomorrow, instead of sending straight signals, maybe better tap out some kind of a message, like, uh, return to same place. Return to same place. Okay by me. How long could you keep that up? As long as the boys can crank the coffee ground. What the good of it? It'd be better if we started walking out of here. How far do you think you'd get? An empty stomach doesn't give you much mileage. That's why we gotta move. We gotta find some food to shoot. Here, it's like everything was already dead. That's enough, Murray. We, we, we might find a river or a stream. I said shut up. You said the planes had come back, Dooley, and they haven't. Shut up! No, they'll never come back, they just... Dooley! Now listen. <laughs> All of you. There's a boy buried out there in that snow because he didn't listen to me. <laughs> our only chance is right here. If the planes can't see our ship from the air, they sure couldn't see us walking. Now, the first one of you who hikes out of this camp here is going to get shot. I'll aim for your legs, but I may miss you and hit you in the back of the head. Now, who's for leaving? All right, that's better. <laughs>
The Nuncio. Mm. Hey, 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 hey. Come on, come on. Wake up. Do we? Yep, yep. Let's start cranky. Oh, it's not even light yet. I will be before long. We want the coffee grinder really warmed up by then. Come on, I'll start it. Some of them stick up pretty high. Hey, one of you other guys. Ralph and I are going to listen to steps. So you hunt for Dooley at 500 kilocycles. Stanish, you guys having any luck? about to drop off. I had it. All right, all right. I'll, I'll take another whirl at it. Keep sending, Denuncia. Keep sending. Clouds would clear away. Stankowski, how about how about spelling me on this thing? Yeah. Dude, listen. Murray, throw me that flare gun. Yes. Here it goes. You think the flare will clear the clouds? Yeah, yeah. Can I see it in this light? Captain? Yeah, yeah. Stanish wrote it. Says, uh, your wife's fine and little, uh, what's-his-name is over his coal. Gee. Oh, Jenny. That's all? Don't say anything else? Mm-hmm, yeah. Ski planes. Be back this afternoon to take you out. Wow! <laughs> Julie, your wife and kids are waiting for you. Huh? What? Hey, Julie, we didn't know you had a wife and kids. Yeah. Six of them. Hmm. <laughs> And thank God I'm going to see him again. In a moment, Vic Powell will return. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Elizabeth Vining was an American who probably had more individual success than anyone else in creating a strong feeling of friendship between the United States and Japan. In 1946, she was selected for the important job of teaching English to the 12-year-old Crown Prince Akihito. Her tour of duty was for two years. In Tokyo, she found a class of 20 boys had been assigned to her. By patiently conducting her class completely in English, 
Miss Vining gradually taught them a language they were eager to learn. Her methods of teaching and subject matter were of her own choice. The boys studied American history and democracy, had discussions on the United Nations, and the prince memorized Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. At the end of her assignment, Miss Vining agreed to stay another year since the prince's English had reached the point where he could understand the expression of ideas. At the end of the third year, Prince Akihito was well acquainted with English and the benefits of a democratic way of life. Miss Vining's work was finished. The emperor and the empress thanked her for the understanding she had brought to the prince and the Japanese children and gave her many gifts to show their gratitude. And what had Elizabeth Vining learned from her work? That she had contributed much toward the future peace of Japan and the rest of the world. That she opened windows which had remained closed too long. As one of her students told her, you have not only taught us English, you have taught us thoughts. Yes, Elizabeth Vining had learned that by helping others, you help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings. Dick Powell, congratulations on a very fine performance. Thank you, and thank you, Irving. I understand you were selected by the nation's top radio and TV editors as the best dramatic show on radio. Yes, in a poll conducted annually by Radio and TV Daily, we're very pleased and proud. We intend to go right on presenting the very best motion pictures Hollywood has produced. How's about next week's show? You won't want to miss it, either, because it's one of the most famous comedies of all time, with one of the greatest romantic teams ever seen on the screen. Another of our 20 greats, this time from Columbia Pictures. The gay mad story of the awful truth. And recreating their original roles, Cary Grant and Irene Dunn. Oh, that's a great one, all right. Good night. Good night, and best regards to Julie. <laughs>